Hello, we're about to start our next panel. Um, the last panel ended on the idea of authentication, how to authenticate pictures and then what to do with the very concept of authentication in the courts. And that's a good place to pick up for our next panel entitled Visualizing Global Crises Coverage. Um, because the question of authentication runs across the papers presented here. But we're going to talk about news. So what happens when the news fails or when it flails because it's a gray area? Um, and what happens specifically when the news doesn't realize that it is failing the different groups with, with which it engages on a day-to-day -day basis? As a traditional business model of journalism crumbles and as reliance on content produced by stakeholders in a story rises, what constitutes the truth, that problematic concept around which news, visual or otherwise, circulates? And what constitutes the truth to whom? And who has the final say over what a news text, whether visual or otherwise, means? From the gay girl in Damascus hoax to the failure of scholarship to accurately capture the values and the power at play in coverage of the Egyptian uprising, these are some of the many questions raised and addressed by this panel. So to introduce our speaker, starting at the very end, Claire Wardle, um, our very own Annenberg alumna, joins us from Columbia University's Tau Center for Digital Journalism, where she currently serves as the Director of Research. Can I just say, everywhere I go, people ask me if I know Claire. <laughs> everywhere in the world. Claire is known in many parts for her work on user-generated content. In 2009, she pioneered the BBC's verification program. Um, she's trained journalists and media personnel around the world in news gathering and news verification in the digital age. Claire brings experience from both the human rights and the press worlds. She has worked with Storyful, with UNHCR, and she currently sits on the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on social media. Claire is also a co-founder of Eyewitness Media Hub, and seeing the panel that came before, everyone should check it out. It's awesome. Um, we also share an advisor, incidentally, who's seated right there. <laughs> Our second speaker may be a familiar face to many of you. Can I call you doctor yet? No? <laughs> The newly minted Amar Ghazze is a recipe, is, he's a recent export from the Annenberg School. He's currently a lecturer in journalism, politics, and public communication at the University of Sheffield. A former Fulbright fellow, Ahmad has also seen journalism at work firsthand from both sides of the Atlantic, um, literally and figuratively. He has a professional background in journalism and media monitoring. He's worked with Al Hayat, the biggest pan-Arab newspaper. He's worked with the BBC Monitoring. So we've shared, and I miss these talks on the endlessly um, entertaining hallways of newsrooms in the Middle East. And finally, joining us from the University of Cape Town in South Africa is Brahim Saleh, a leading scholar on political communication, journalism, and crisis management, among many others, um, particularly focused on the Middle East and North Africa. A Fulbright Scholar and a fellow at the Africa Climate and Development, Dr. Saad, excuse me? Initiative, it's missing a word. Uh, Dr. Saleh is engaged in both academic and practitioner perspectives. I, this is my first time meeting him, but I had heard a lot about him from here and also in the Middle East. He works closely with the UN Alliance of Civilizations Media Literacy Education Clearinghouse, as well as the Academic Council on the United Nations System in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, he's one of the most vocal and prolific writers on the areas of media and violence in the region. Um, so I guess we'll keep the Q&A to the end. So let's talk news. Thank you very much for that introduction, uh, too kind. Uh, the reason that everybody knows me is because I've lived in five cities in the last five years, so uh, different countries, that's why. Um, I'd also say a huge thank you to Monroe and also to Sandra, um, and to say that it's a real pleasure to be back. Uh, as you suggested, I did my PhD here, and yesterday I was sitting in this room thinking, what's different? And I was used to sit in these rooms desperately worried whether I'd ever get a job. And I was like, oh, I've got a job, I'm fine now. Uh, and secondly, I go to a lot of newsroom industry events, and they're full of manals. Just panels of white American men. So can I congratulate you on an incredibly diverse and wonderful conference. And uh, there's been the occasional white American man, but um, there's been <laughs> lots of diversity. So I wanted to say thank you. OK, so um, as I mentioned, I'm currently the research director at the Tau Center. But um, I've been researching eyewitness media for the last eight years. And two years ago, I did a big piece of work kind of revisiting that BBC, BBC um, study about how much of this stuff is used every day. And off the back of that, I published a PDF document, and I thought, this is just going to sit on people's shelves, and nobody's going to read this apart from my mum. But actually, there's a lot of recommendations in here. 
Um, so we actually got some funding and created the Eyewitness Media Hub to try and create resources and to actually continue research to say, this is a really important area and we need to get this stuff out quickly, we need to talk about it, we need to support the industry. So that's what Eyewitness uh, Media Hub is. Um, I'm going to start with this, the ugliest slide ever I created. It took me a long time to make such an ugly slide. The purpose being, it is a horrible phrase. The phrase user-generated content is really problematic for me when we think about this type of material. Um, and there's a reason for this, because ultimately it focuses on the word content. It allows journalists to think about this as stuff, as Keith mentioned earlier, it's stuff that they can take, use, not credit, not pay for, not think about people's safety. Um, and user-generated content is still a worthwhile phrase for TripAdvisor reviews or animations or mashups on YouTube. I'm fine with that. But what I'm talking specifically about is original photographs or videos that are not posed or scripted, which are deemed to be valuable by news or human rights organisations who seek to, to use and distribute them through their own channels. So my focus is on calling it eyewitness media because there's somebody there behind the camera phone. There is an eyewitness to this. And often that gets completely removed. And journalists will talk about, I would go to prison to protect my source. But if their source is a person who happened to capture some material, they're just gonna trample over their rights, ignore them, and just you know abuse them. So the reason for trying to talk about eyewitness media is to remind people there is a person in all of this. So yesterday I was sitting here and I was thinking, you know, there's so much discussion about human rights. You know, how am I going to justify why I'm here talking about the news media? And of course, what's been happening over the last 18 months is a perfect example of how the news media have played a really critical role in amplifying events that have been taking place, but we necessarily didn't have the visual images to go alongside. And here's this guy, Kevin Moore, who, if you've ever heard him speak, is unbelievable. He was a very good friend of Freddie Gray and was woken up in the morning by Freddie Gray screaming when he was being arrested. And so Kevin Moore jumps out of bed with his phone in his pocket, dashes outside and just starts capturing what's happening to his friend. And so I met him at an event in New York in September and I said, I'm really interested in this, Kevin. Like, what made you submit this material to the news media? He was like, I didn't intend to do that at first. I went downtown to internal affairs and I sat there for seven hours because I wanted the police to investigate what had happened to my friend. I didn't even think about the media. But after seven hours of being ignored, I said, that's it. And he, just, he walked into the local CBS affiliate and said, I've got something you might be interested in. And it got used by many, many different people. And there's a really interesting case here, which is if any of you in this room happen to capture this level of police brutality or violence, what would you do? Would you upload it to YouTube or to Twitter? Would you sit on it and call your lawyer? Would you take it to the police station? So actually Witness has written some nice pieces about actually the practicalities of what you should do in this kind of eventuality. But for me, this, this kind of space that we now sit in, uh, whether it's Witness who do incredible work or obviously Christoph's work, and we've worked closely together before in the Citizen Evidence Lab, there's very much human rights space, but also Storyful, which for transparency purposes I worked for for a year in 2012, or reportedly also a news organisation doing great work in this space. And as Keith mentioned, you know, when we're talking about this stuff, uh, it's very much there's great stuff happening in, in, in these spaces, whether they're human rights or journalism. Also, I de decided today, people who love citrus are interested <laughs> in these things. There's a kind of a yellow-orange theme uh, when you actually look at these logos, which I hadn't noticed until this morning. So a couple of years ago, I published this uh, with two uh, co-authors, Sam Dudley and Pete Brown, and it was the, the piece of work about how much of this stuff is put out by broadcast news organisations. And then very quickly, we replicated that for online newspaper sites, and from that, we talked to a number of eyewitnesses who had had their material used. So we found the videos or images in our content analysis, and then we would do some investigations, and we'd find them online and say, could we just talk to you about how you felt when your video was used? And they'd say, what video? <laughs> We say, well, the video here, it's on the Daily Mail's... Well, I had no idea that they'd use my video. Should I be calling a lawyer? So we actually tracked down a lot of eyewitnesses who had no idea that their material had ever been used by a news organisation. We then did focus groups with UK audiences to try and find out how audiences respond to this type of material. And just before the holidays, we put out a piece of work that we'd done with journalists and human rights workers about the impact of consuming this amount of content um, in their everyday work and what are the repercussions of that. And there's a lot of evidence now that journalists and human rights workers are starting to exhibit the same symptoms of PTSD that you'd previously associate with people in the field. So all of these have come out in the last two years. They're not peer reviewed, but they will be. But this stuff has to come out quickly. <laughs> 
anybody who edits a journal uh, will know sometimes the turnaround isn't as quick. Um, but if you're interested in any of these studies, you can access it on the website mhub.co forward slash research. So I just wanted to do a kind of a descriptive overview. There's so much in this space, and I was struggling to think about what can I focus on. And I thought, I'm just going to throw a lot of stuff out there, and hopefully that will lead to some good discussions. But number one, newsrooms are increasingly relying on eyewitness media, or eyewitness stuff, which could be my new phrase. Um, so over a three-week period on eight global TV channels, there are over 2,000 pieces of eyewitness media that were used by the global news channels. If you compare that with online, uh, it was significantly more, not surprisingly, more space online. And if you're the Daily Mail and you're looking for page views, you embed the video and then you take eight screen grabs from the same video and put them on different pages. So not really surprising. But when you looked at where this kind of content was used, it was to illustrate protests. It was to illustrate breaking news events, crashes, explosions, the stuff that makes newsrooms tick. There was a very heavy reliance on this type of material. And often it was the very first images that we, was used. So the Glasgow helicopter crash was part of our sampling time period. The BBC ran four twit pics on repeat for the first 20 minutes. No crediting, no nothing, just content that had come from the social web. So um, oh, this is just to compare the Daily Mail. I'm not going to apologize for abusing the Daily Mail. But when you look there, just in the Daily Mail, compared to all of the eight global news channels, uh, you can see there was a huge reliance on that. Um, and as not surprisingly, we, we talked about this, and I know this is going to come up later, Syria, where it's been impossible for journalists to go on the ground for the last two to three years, means that there was a huge reliance simply on material from, from Syria. Um, and also Egypt protests were happening, the Ukraine protests, the helicopter crash, and Black Friday was the fifth one, which was Americans elbowing their best friends out of the way at Target. So a classic eyewitness media news story. Um, so talking to uh, audiences about how they think, this kind of gets to some of the stuff we were just grappling with. And it's just one quote, and I recommend that you read the whole report, but um, this is Raymond. It's actually genuine as opposed to manufactured. It's catching things as they happen, which is much more important. We're looking for the immediacy of the situation. So when someone captures an accident or a robbery happening on their phone, it is actually of the event. They can never reproduce it. And there was a lot of discourse around journalists constructing the news, whereas they can't construct eyewitness media because it's raw and it's authentic and it's the truth. Uh, it's fascinating the ways that audiences would talk about this type of material. And oh, we, don't, we want it to be more shaky. The more shaky it is, the more we, knew, we know that it's true. So very interesting in comparison to journalists who don't like it to be shaky. Secondly, newsroom structures and processes are adapting slowly and with difficulty. So lots of the newsrooms uh, staff that we would talk to would describe it as a wild west. They would say, we haven't got a clue what we're doing. And P.S., what are CNN doing? They just would say, we don't, you know, nobody really knows. We're making it up as we go along. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> but there was a real sense of, you know, this stuff is difficult for us to handle and it's happened so quickly. How do we respond as newsrooms to these changes? And the biggest problem, as I saw it, was that news managers, many of whom had never sat on a breaking news shift in front of a tweet deck scrolling columns of hashtagged geolocated tweets from an incident. So they couldn't actually understand the way that news gathering had changed. They didn't understand the techniques that were needed in order to verify that content. So there was a huge deficit in terms of training and support, mostly because news managers hadn't got a clue. Um, and we're actually, in, this is a kind of an interesting ethics question. When we talk to news managers, we'd say, are you happy for your name to be used? Is this all on the record? Yes, not a problem, Claire, whatever. Everything I say is absolutely fine. And then they would say things that were so career limiting that then I couldn't use their names. <laughs> because they'd say things like, why would we even care about the audience, Claire? I mean, why are we going to credit them? Like, nobody's interested in their name. So it was really interesting for me about what should I put in and what not, because the news managers were so blinkered about the audience in particular. Um, uh, those of you that are staying after lunch, uh, we're doing a verification workshop, which will involve this classic eagle video, one of my favorites. Um, but this, the phrase verification was really interesting in the ways that it was used. One journalist from an organization that remained nameless, buy me a drink later, said, verification is always an afterthought. It's sort of like, let's just get it on air and online and then not worry about it. When someone puts something forward in an editorial meeting, I say, have you verified it? And people groan. People are scared of the V word. They know it's going to take a long time, which it doesn't necessarily take a long time, but there was a real fear in newsrooms that this shouldn't be the type of work that we're doing. And this idea of it as content played out in the fact that newsrooms are incredibly reliant on the agencies. So uh, we have talked about this before, but agencies are often understudied 
in journalism studies, but particularly in this space, absolutely crucial. Very few newsrooms can do this work themselves. So they are entirely reliant on AP, Reuters and AFP to do the discovery and verification and to clear permission rights for the newsrooms. And it's seen as an insurance um, kind of policy. But the other issue is the material comes in via the wires and is automatically ingested into the content management systems in the newsrooms. So the producer is sitting there in the gallery. Oh, it's just a picture. It's just a video. And they don't know whether it's come from Reuters and it was a Reuters camera or whether it was actually from Kevin Moore. But Reuters have acquired the rights from Kevin Moore. And in fact, when we did the research, Reuters on the dope sheet, which describes what you're, what you're seeing, the source would say social media website as if Twitter itself had created it, when of course it hadn't, it would be been Kevin Moore. So, you know, in terms of the news organisations, there is an element of, well, they can only rely on the information they're receiving. So crediting was a really interesting question. Um, from the study of over 2,000 pieces on the TV news um, study, only 16% of the pieces of eyewitness media had a credit, as in credit Kevin Moore. Um, and higher online, but that's often because it was embedded, and when something's embedded, you automatically get the credit. Um, Labelling, I also find, um, have very strong feelings about this. I used to work at UNHCR, and we would capture a lot of material from the field, and then we would upload that to YouTube. That would often then get used by the BBC, who would never label it as coming from UNHCR. Now, in the same way as we think about how do we label ISIS, also, how do you label material that's coming from the field and is being filmed by somebody from UNHCR? So labelling, for me, explaining to the audience the motivation for the person who captured this, I think is really important from a transparency point of view. A uh, great deal of ignorance about rights and permissions. This probably doesn't surprise anybody. Uh, but this test case was a very interesting one. From January 2010 in Haiti, Daniel Morel, a very good photographer, went to Haiti and took a number of amazing photos. Because it was Jan January 2010, Twitter was very new. He was like, I'm going to try this new Twitter machine. And so he uploaded his pictures to Twitter without any kind of watermark. Some other guy just took those photos down or just copied them and then re-uploaded them to his own account. AFP came along to the second person and said, oh, these are great photos, can we use them? Not, are these your pictures? Just, can we use these pictures? And the guy said, yeah, not a problem. So AFP distributed it out to all and sundry. Many people ran with these images, but of course it wasn't credited to Daniel Morell. Daniel Morell took AFP to court, sued for a large amount of money, and I thought that that would be a turning point and newsrooms would start realising they couldn't do this. Turns out, most newsrooms don't know about this court case and they're still merrily just trampling on people's rights. This could be a game changer. This is a 32 second video of a storm over Buffalo. The guy who captured this, an intellectual property lawyer. So he is taking CBC and CNN to court. So we need to watch this space carefully because this could be the turning point. Informed consent. When I was at UNHCR, we knew what consent looked like. It was very strict. You could not capture somebody's image unless you absolutely understood that they understood what you were saying. That doesn't work in the news business. So if some of you can see this, I blocked out names for privacy. Most of them are CNN. Hi, I'm with them. Can and all domestic and international affiliates use these photos in perpetuity on all platforms and online? Hi, Bruce. I work with... Can we permanently use your pictures, videos on all of our platforms and affiliates? There's all sorts of words here. Perpetuity, affiliates, distribution, syndication, exclusivity. The audience do not have a clue about these terms. And we did focus group work, and this amazing 85-year-old just said this. What does it mean? I mean, it's gobbledygook, isn't it? She was British. Um, but there's a, like, the audience would say, how am I meant to understand this? Or people saying, I just said yes because I was scared. I didn't know what it meant and I didn't want to ask. So the news organisations are not interested in the, this being informed consent. They just want to get a yes. And they then screen grab that yes because lots of eyewitnesses will take down, they'll delete the yes. So lawyers now say we have to take a screen grab. This is an example from Charlie Hebdo when this didn't appear on social media. The woman who took it was called Anne Gelbard. Le Monde journalists were walking down the street and said, has anybody got any pictures? And she said, oh, actually, I do. I've got this one. So this particular journalist tweeted it with her name attached, thinking that was the right thing to do. Anne Gelbard makes hats. And if you now go to Google, her history of being a hat maker is completely obliterated by the fact that her image was used around Charlie Hebdo. So for me, I've really changed my position on crediting because now I've got a real understanding of many eyewitnesses do not want to have their name attached. They don't want to be harassed on Twitter with people saying, did you take payment for this? Or you shouldn't have filmed, you should have stopped and helped people. And many people saying, I just don't want to be part of the search history. So for me, this question is a, it's an involving one. It's really interesting. And so embedding, 
Sorry, this is whistle stop, but there's so many things to talk about. Um, but live blogs will embed content from Instagram or Twitter. You do not have to ask permission to embed content. You only have to ask permission if you're taking it down from the platform and re-uploading it into your own system, so television, essentially. Here, when people are embedding, that credit just automatically gets there. So many people said, I put it on Instagram for my 50 followers. The next thing I knew, I was on the front page of the BBC, and my life was completely changed because of it. So there are real issues in round embedding and what that, what that means. Uh, very quickly, safety. Newsrooms are getting better at this, but this is one of my favorite slides. This is when the Coast Guard in the UK had to ask Sky News to stop asking people to send in photos of coastal storms and instead warn people to keep away from the coast. So there's a lot here around essentially commissioning and newsrooms asking people to send in their pictures and people believing in Tahrir Square and many other places, if I cross the police lines, I'm actually going to get something on the news or even make payment. Anybody see Nightcrawler with Jake Gyllenhaal? Yes. It, all of this, but with smartphones. Uh, finally, newsrooms are struggling with how to handle graphic imagery. So the Virginia shootings, I blocked this out, but I think many people were re really struggling with autoplay. What does this mean? Should we be using the footage that was captured by the, the shooter? And this is Andy Carvin, who did put out, he's a journalist, he did put out some screenshots and had to remove them and really opened up a very interesting conversation about, should I have been sharing this? The problem with newsrooms, they say, well, actually, the audience has already seen it because it's already out there on social media, so we can just put it out there. So increasingly in newsrooms, they're saying, we can see our own boundaries moving. We never used to show moment of death, and now we are, because people are seeing it on social media. Uh, and when we did focus groups, a lot of the audience unprompted brought this up and said, I saw Walter Scott shot, a man running away in the park. I can't unsee that. I saw the police officer shot dead in the street in Paris. I can't unsee that. It still haunts me. The audience unprompted kept talking about graphic imagery. OK. Vicarious trauma, there's a great report, you should read it. And uh, ethical guidelines, we've put out ethical guidelines as have witnessed. There's some really interesting work about how can we support newsrooms in these questions that they're struggling with. So thank you very much. First of all, thank you, Sandra, and thank you for the invitation. And I hope I will be able, within these 15 minutes, to try to share some fresh thoughts of something that seems to be, at least for many, quite complicated and sometimes misleading in reading the data and dealing with the data. I chose to, to give the title for my presentation, The Insolvency of Egypt's uh, Cultural Crisis, How Visualization of Fear, Tears, and Blood. I mean, and here I'd like to, and I picked this, one of the visuals I found about this kind of between, behind bars, the young people, because a number of issues I like to highlight, how young people feel tormented and this kind of crossing roads, how it is sort of looking forward to all what we expected and aspired in the Middle East and North Africa of getting rid of uh, oppression and moving forward and how this has been sort of firing back and the kind of perplexity and how this not only affected media and journalism per se, but rather the whole society. This kind of perplexity, what can we do? Uh, is it frustrating or not? To start with, I like to highlight one of the issues that affected many times how the Middle East, North Africa, and in my case study Egypt, where I come from, has been sort of going into this sort of trouble. And one of the key issues is this kind of crossing roads, this kind of romantic idealism of Arab nationalism, what Gamal Abdel Nasser established, the second Egyptian president, that we are this kind of unity, we are great, we're wonderful. And at the same time, another element that affected many things during the, the revolutions, uprising, upheavals, name it the way you want, this kind of the otherness. And these two elements play the very sort of key elements. And what do people say? What do people expect and aspire at the same time? How do want, people want to talk about the crisis and the problem? This kind of anger, frustration, looking forward, we need to get back to what we used to be. I'm not sure what used to be means, but I mean, this has been a recurrent theme. <clears throat> In general, I mean, I think there, is, there has been continuous failure to connect ideas and concepts uh, developed uh, about scholarly work about the Middle East, and I think this is one of the things that I, I like to emphasize here. Most of the time, we don't have literature done by people from the region who speak the language, who sp understand the culture, who can make sense out of the context. And sometimes when you have these elements, they are having their own political agenda, so they tend to sort of slant, direct what they have before them. So by itself, the, the mediation or the kind of scholarly work about what we're doing, the kind of journalism, is also an element to make the story shallow, superficial, goes through many cycles. Another thing that 
most of the time because, for example, journalism did not evolve from the Arab world, Middle East. So even when it comes to practice, there has been a copycat of Western models. And this has created many dilemmas in the implementation. If we put in perspective the political agenda, the social taboos, and so on and so forth. So on one hand, we don't have enough literature. On the other hand, we have people who try to imitate, but they are stuck between what they want to do as great ideas and the system and the structure, which affected many things in that regard. And here I refer to academics, and I refer to professionals in that regard. They are always afraid. This culture of fear has been very much affecting the whole story line or narrative about it. Uh, Egyptians are no longer trusting the military or political Islam. Again, this is one of the things that started my main focus in the research is about 2011 uh, till 2013, but I think it's a common thing that I would like to generalize about it. This trust uh, the social contract between the people and the government, social contract between even the religion and what the religion is supposed to be doing, it's an issue that is question mark. Uh, <clears throat> uh, just to give a little bit of an overview of Egypt, because I think one of the problems about dealing with MENA, Middle East, North Africa, that people tend to miss the differences and diversities. Uh, for example, people comparing statistics even about new media when they talk about 60% in Qatar versus 20% uh, in Egypt. What are we talking about? Are we crazy? We're talking about 240, 300,000 compared to almost 90 million. So even reading data is an issue in dealing with this. The narrative itself is affected. We tend to, and I think in general that's, again, I can generalize about it. We tend to say the statistics say it's 20 and 60 and so on, and less into the context. So here I'd like, with it, without taking your time, to highlight some of the issues. We have 89 million living inside Egypt. We are talking about 89 million living on only 4% of the, uh, the, the, the space of Egypt. We're talking about 45% of Egyptians living uh, on less than $2 day and inflation reached as high as 12.97. That's one of the latest statistics. And we're talking about society that is young. So this number one, that's one. Another thing is unemployment. According to official statistics, we're talking about 13.4% with 71% uh, uh, aging between 15 and 29 years old. But another thing, most of the time statistics do not refer to mixed match and uh, disguised unemployment. So again, these statistics are not reflective of the severity uh, of the society. Um, one of the things that I would say as a thesis for my research is that we cannot equate protesters' violence with state brutality. Most of the time, the kind of coverage of protest, which is, again, an evolving idea in the Middle East and North Africa, protest culture, protest music, and so on and so forth. But most of the time, we don't deal fairly with what is the police brutality and what did the, the people in the protest did. And that's something missing, again, most of the time for commercialization, for superficiality of the coverage. But at the end, it remains what really happened and what is the impact of what happened. That's a a question that rarely discussed and addressed. A public soaring uh, resulted from denying protesters' demands and widening generational gap that created confrontational disagreements. One of the things that affected Egypt and the rest of the Middle East, regardless of the difference of examples and the, the crisis, is most of the time you have a breed of uh, generational gap that the older generation, they like to be uninvolved. While the younger generations, they want to move forward. Again, I like to remind you of my statistics. We're talking about almost 65% who are young. So here you have very frustrated people who want to change their lives. They have nothing else to lose, and they want to move forward. And this can at least give uh, some highlight on why protests are still going, why people are, you know, this kind of Chinese thing. Once you get out, out of the, uh, the, the, the cage, you cannot climb back off. And the idea here that people are fed up, the young people have no hope in the future, then that's why they are becoming more and more violent in what they want. So again, that's just a note on the side. Um, just to give general thing about the, some of the unfolding of events, January 2011, there were uh, anti-Mubarak regime demonstrations. Uh, uh, June 30th, 2012, alternate candidate of the Muslim uh, Brotherhood, uh, the Freedom and Justice Party, Mohamed Morsi, was elected. Uh, August 12, Morsi uh, nullified the declaration which triggered the change. Uh, and uh, Morsi was impeached and an interim president, Adli Mansour, uh, sworn on uh, July 4th. Uh, the, uh, Egypt is, had always many problems, but violence was not part of the package. But one of the interesting, I would say interesting in the sense of trying to map it, that violence and becoming more violent society, it is one of the sort of increasing, um, I would say general, uh, I would describe it now as becoming much more violent than before. So violence, society, violence, attacks in the streets, that has become 
a very increasing phenomenon that is worth thinking about. And the kind of coverage of the violence is also reaching new benchmarks. Most of the time, I mean, as uh, Egypt, Egypt is not a religious society, it is a conservative society. And that's one of the things that, so one of the things about this, uh, uh, not religious but conservative, that even when it comes to media, uh, there were many social taboos. And sometimes social taboos can be stronger in covering and discussing things. So one of the changes that took place, people are fed up to the extent that the kind of coverage is becoming more violent more gore in many ways, and that's a change. And many of the, what I've done, I tried to collect whatever available online about people and networks covering the 18 days of the first uprising. And one of the striking things that more um, graphic pictures about the violence is taking place more than other things. And that's one of the preliminary comments that I have. I think that um, the Egyptian culture of violence entailed ideological confrontations and acute political and identity crisis. As I mentioned in the beginning, that we're having part of the deal that everybody wants to play the advocate. So you'll find sometimes academics, sometimes journalists, when they try to write a story, this blurring lines between investigative reporting and opinion is becoming more and more on the rise. Everybody defends my part of the, the game. So polarization, the ideological confrontation is automatically taken into crisis and conflict and me, myself, or I, or you are wrong. So pinpointing and shaming and naming have, has become part of the, the game. Uh, protest culture uh, endured continuous swing between revolution and counter-revolution. In five years now, most of the time you have protests and coverage of the protest. One say that Morsi is terrible, the other one says that Morsi is great. So all the time we get one extreme or the other and we have less analysis, less coverage, less fact finding about what really happened and even visuals that would focus on simple ideas like, you know, somebody would uh, been attacked and blood and less about what happened about that. Only snapshots, even when it comes to video, there is a very, uh, very, very, I, I would say very important video that has been viral on social media, um, and it's about how Morsi uh, uh, troops pushed people out of the buildings. And it's a very famous uh, video available online. I didn't want to share it with you, but the point is, most of the time, who said that these are people belonging to Morsi, and what happened, and so on. So most of the time, it's one saying one argument, the other is reporting the other argument, and no real discussion about about what's happening. And here I would call it that more presence about the, the crisis and less participation. This kind of dialogue through media, social media, or name it, it is less there. More of, I point that you're mistaken, and you point that I'm mistaken, and that's the fight. I like a quote by Thomas Friedman here, and it says that uh, the, uh, the 2011 uh, got rid of the dead head, and in 2013, the second revolution got rid of the uh, uh, dead heads with the hope that Egypt's culture <coughs> sorry, of violence will escape the deadlock that might confront if the situation persists. And I also like the, the, the quote is, Egypt is like a house where the curtains have been changed, but everything else is the same. And I think that it might describe this kind of continuous crisis problem, that you have a crisis, people feel tormented, they don't know what to do, violence is on the rise, problems are on the rise, but at the end of the day, nothing is happening. It's this kind of push and pull all the time with no development about the crisis. Um, I think that, as I mentioned earlier, very briefly, that the society is becoming more uh, violent, and polarization between members of the same society is, is on the rise. The military and remnants, we call it a new term that we use in an Egyptian dialect, which is very famous with use, uh, playing with words, the fulul, which is the people belonging to Mubarak. So again, we're having number of political actors fighting using media, new media or social media, name it. At the end of the day, each one is trying to project an image, a position, and less about what is happening behind this position. <clears throat> um, I think that the perplexity reflected the diversified trajectories of people, technology, money, images, and ideas uh, into different directions. As I mentioned yesterday in my comment intervention in the morning, I think, who is using social media? We tend to a part of the romantic idealism that, yeah, everybody in the Arab world and Egypt is having access to the internet. That's bully. That's not true. And we're talking about statistics that vary and nothing accurate, but at the end of the day, we're playing within a rate of 20%. And those who have mobile phones, they can afford. But how many people have mobile phones, but they are smartphones? So there are a number of questions. I don't have time to discuss it. But there are a number of questions when we talk about uh, the technology that we need to be cautious and careful about what we're talking about and to what extent this has been part of the political activism and online activism that we're talking about. And to what extent, who is using, in other words, who is using social media to post certain things? Is it the police? Is it the military? 
is it the elite? Are we talking about the, the majority of the people? One of the things that I feel very concerned about studies in the Middle East and Arab world, especially when it comes to 2011 until today, most of the studies, and you can check what I'm telling you, most of the studies have taken students in uh, English speaking or elite universities and they talk about it as if it's Egypt. That is not true. We're talking about society that is having many problems and those who have access might not be interested in politics and those who have access and have interest in politics, they don't speak English. So there are a number of factors that I'd like you to think about when we deal about that. Um, hence, we would say that we have a so, sort of schizophrenic relation between media consumption and actual knowledge. We have many people talking about something and less people about really contextualizing what we're talking about and to what extent this means anything. Um, just to share some ideas uh, about the visualization of crisis, much of the local uh, media is polarized, uh, politicized, and biased. And here I'd like to add that we have, since 2011, even available online, the, we have a narrative that addresses the international global audiences, something that would be said in English to, add, to deal with the idea that the savvy young Egyptians who had the Facebook revolution, and we have another na narrative, for, narrative for the local people, things that can affect them and mobilize them and move them into taking a certain action. So here, again, one point to add about that is this kind of dichotomy sometimes between the narratives. Well, are we talking about a global narrative that would fit, fulfill the idea of savvy young Egyptians, or are we talking about the local narrative that is dealing with the real people and how they are suffering and why did they take action? That's the video I didn't want to share with you because it was, it was I'm, I'm very d difficult to even follow, though, and first time I've seen it, I mean, I, I think it's very difficult to watch. It's actually throwing away people from the top of the building. And to what extent this has played a role in, in dealing with the crisis and to what extent is this real? To what extent are we talking about authenticity? To what extent who are the actors involved and how it was portrayed? Are there any background about it? Just the video that makes people go crazy and mobilize and more violent. So again, pushing for mobilization. Just one minute, I'll, if you please just give me... Two minutes to finish. Uh, here is an example of many examples I found that what is available online and in traditional media is this. One we love and the other we hate. And nothing in between to explain why we love and why we hate. And who loves and why and who, you know what I mean? So just positions and stereotyping and going for that. Uh, the, one of the other intriguing, interesting stuff that most of the time the, when it comes to fabrication and the, uh, the faking events, you will find the same event online from different sources depending on the position of the source. And one says a story and the other one talks about the same incident and both are available on YouTube telling you a different story when it comes to the narration of the video. And here it's, again, mobilizing the public through. So what we have in front of us is that can be any way of fact-finding uh, or just mobilizing for a certain thing. Again. I wish I had time to discuss it. But uh, the news coverage focused on the death toll in Cairo. Most of the coverage in five years always focused, almost, I would say, almost more than 60%, always focused on Cairo because Cairo is the political system. So to what extent the political system has affected the mediatization of politics that's happening? Again, it's another question that's worth further investigation. Uh, just final observations, uh, the, the Egyptian crisis had its uh, ramification across MENA, but different actors and players quickly move their chess pieces in expectations of momentum. Most of, most of the time, if you follow what's available on, and that was very interesting for me to find, that most of the time you find testimonials from certain people, uh, political actors, political parties saying something after some time, they have completely changed what they said, and they're saying something else to just to, see, uh, to uh, sort of emphasize the current position. Last comment, because I'm, I'm done with time. Two questions that I think we need to recall and think about later. Should Egypt continue to collapse into violence and this way, will Egypt's cultural insolvency be lifted with the army or will it be one-sided backers? Again, this makes their position more than visualization and more than the crisis. To what extent can we deal with this kind of entrenched problems that has created crisis as a cause and effect? Thank you for your time. Sorry. Thank you.